Hi, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney's Evil Twin. And this is the Bad News Network. This past week, there were two catastrophic mass shootings in El Paso, Texas and Dayton, Ohio. We at Ranger Up want to send our sincere condolences to the families of those who lost their lives. These tragedies have naturally caused a torrent of emotion, and once again, we're left with the question of what do Americans do about gun violence and also hate groups? I'll be honest, this one is really hard for me to address for a lot of reasons. It's hard because when you're talking about the loss of lives of innocent men, women, and children, it's impossible to remove emotion from the equation. It's hard because human life is tangible and priceless. And while the ideals of our constitution are so absolutely critical to being American, it's very easy to consider them being less important when you're talking about the death of an innocent person. And it's especially hard because we're all so entrenched in our positions that as soon as someone starts espousing an idea that is not the outcome that we personally want, it awakens a rage inside of us. But I'm going to try anyway. I'm gonna start with the easier piece of this, and that's white nationalism. Contrary to what the media will make you believe, this isn't some giant growing group in American society. In fact, it's such a shrinking, tiny, non-existent piece of America that until these recent incidents, we've been able to pretend that they don't even exist. However, that small group is certainly emboldened as of late. There's significant evidence that the El Paso shooter did it purely because he wanted to shoot Mexicans and he considered them to be a threat to the American way of life. What an absolutely disgusting person. So how does this happen? A generation ago, it would be hard to find in any community more than one or two guys that even thought some of the thoughts that this guy had. And certainly you wouldn't be able to put enough of them together where you, know, you would feel comfortable or, or propped up by that group of people. And now with the advent of the internet, it's easier for these losers to find each other and embolden each other and build each other up and push themselves to a point where someone is taking action, real action instead of just complaining in order to impress their friends. I believe that any group of people espousing these ideals should be reported to law enforcement, should be surveilled to the maximum extent allowed by the Fourth Amendment, should have warrants put in place where applicable for advanced surveillance, and should be treated like any other potential terror threat. Now, I want to be clear. I'm very well aware that people like AOC are trying to weaponize this idea. She tweeted yesterday that all white people essentially have white nationalism lying dormant inside them, like some kind of creepy, weird Walking Dead episode. That's profoundly stupid and a real lazy way of trying to guilt people into seeing things your way. But there are people out there that really believe that brown and black people do not have a place in America. And if I could Thanos snap them out of existence, I would. Unfortunately, that's not currently an option. So we need to work to ensure that the threat that those people provide to America is minimized. We need to do this the same way that we would for any other radical un-American terrorist group. I'm also well aware that the Dayton shooter was a leftist. Why am I not talking about his belief system in the same way that I would about the El Paso shooter? Because the evidence doesn't show that he was murdering people out of any particular ethos system, but rather he was just an evil loser. If we find out that there's a group of people planning to murder people on the right, then by all means, add those people to the same terrorist watch list. So now to the harder part, what do we do about gun violence? There's the numbers, there's the emotion, and then there's the real problem. Let's start with the thesis that we all want to eliminate mass murders. I hope we can all agree on that premise. So how do we do that? I can't give you a clear answer to that question. So what I've tried to do is build a productive framework so that we can understand each other's position instead of just yelling into the abyss of social media. The loudest voices on the left do not have any appreciation for gun rights and they believe it's part of an antiquated system that harkens back to a time period where plantation owners had slaves and the weapon of the day was a muzzle loader. The loudest voices on the right believe that the phrase shall not be infringed should be placed above all else and any perceived attack or actual attack on that is something that they're willing to fight to the death over. A rational person can obviously see the problem this presents. The Democratic Party can say things like, we're not trying to take away your guns, we just want common sense gun reform, but the reality is that there are a bunch of people in that party and the loudest voices at that that do in fact want to take away your guns. If you're a staunch 2A believer, you have no choice but to look at these people as your enemy. 
And to those on the far left who have never fired a weapon, never owned a weapon, and who wouldn't be affected in the short term in any way, shape, or form by removal of weapons from the general population, they look at those guys as just small-dicked losers who live in fantasy land. They believe that they're smarter and more evolved than their conservative counterparts. Then you have most people. They may be gun people and they may not be gun people. They generally believe in the Second Amendment, but also don't want people to continue dying in these events. They're not okay with doing nothing, but they also don't really know what to do, so they end up leaning one way or the other towards the loudest voices. So to find a palatable solution for most people, we'd have to build a framework that does not in any unreasonable way infringe on the Second Amendment, but also decreases the likelihood that these perverted individuals can get access to firearms legally. Because again, no amount of legislation is going to get rid of all of these attacks, no matter what we do. So point by point, here are the things being currently argued and some of their discussion points. Video games. It's not freaking video games. This is a profoundly bad take and people should be embarrassed for making it. Universal background checks. While the overwhelming majority of all weapons are purchased with a background check, there is a small subset of transactions in a small subset of states that don't. In these instances, if your primary method of making money is not to sell weapons, you can pass weapons to family members or an individual sales without a background check. This number is minuscule, but it's an unnecessary gap in the system. So why do some people oppose universal background checks despite the fact that most Americans, including 72% of NRA members, support it? The chief concern is that once it's a federal mandate, people believe that these checks are going to be cataloged and will be the first step towards eventual gun confiscation. This is an odd hill to die on in this day and age. What I mean by that is the Fourth Amendment is all but dead. I assume the government has knowledge of all my emails, all my texts, and certainly the guns that I own if I hadn't lost all of them in an unfortunate canoe accident. So here's my top of the head suggestion to consider. Make universal background checks the law of the land, but make it illegal for the government to catalog the guns that any individual owns. I don't know if it's the right idea, but it's an idea. Shoot holes in it, pun intended. A new assault weapons ban. The idea here is that because most of these attacks are done with an AR or an AK, that if you removed those weapons, these attacks would suddenly disappear. People like to ask, why would you own these weapons of war? Or what will you hunt with these? Again. To people that don't own weapons or believe that we've evolved past previous civilizations, the idea of owning an AR is preposterous. To gun owners and to people that think that man has never changed throughout the course of history, that concept has one banging one's head against the wall. So a few things about that. With the exception of the Vegas shooter where he had significant standoff, all of these mass shootings could have been done just as effectively with pistols. Some people like to talk about the muzzle velocity of the AR and how that would make it worse, but I promise you that these people would be just as dead just as fast with 9mm rounds. Second, people are showing an image over and over again of a 100 round drum magazine. They're ineffective, they jam, and for me they fall right into that same category of this is stupid along with bump stocks. So I don't really care one way or the other on these. Real shooters can mag change in a second or less, so this isn't going to affect the efficacy of anyone's system. An even odder ban to people that shoot regularly is the idea of a 10 round magazine being the absolute limit. I'm hardly an elite shooter, but if you ask me to dump two 15 round mags into a target and then ask me to dump three 10 round mags into a target all for time, you'd find the time and accuracy were negligible. So as a gun owner, these kinds of restrictions seem silly. And the idea that somebody could actually be committing a federal crime by accidentally driving across state lines with a 15 round mag is absurd. Three, these weapons in general terms, unless there's a feral hog epidemic, are not for hunting. They exist to protect us from a tyrannical government. I know people like to giggle at this idea, but I find it odd that in the same breath that they giggle, they call President Trump a tyrant and claim he's going to hold on to the presidency regardless of whether or not he actually wins the election. The follow on joke always adds that we couldn't beat tanks and close air support and drones with these weapons. And the obvious answer there is all you have to do is look at Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam where we had significant military superiority and still couldn't bend the enemy to our will. 
The AR is the minimum necessary weapon to have that fight. You cannot fight the government with shotguns, you cannot fight the government with pistols, and you're gonna have a real hard time doing it with a bolt action rifle. Economic downturns in politics can easily lead to civil war. We've seen it in Bosnia and Kosovo, we've seen it in Syria, we've seen it in Venezuela. The idea that Americans are special and would never devolve into that kind of state is comical. You need to look no further than Hurricane Katrina to see how quickly everything can get ugly. That place was a virtual war zone. I personally find it very hard to believe anyone that says they believe in the Second Amendment but also believes in an assault weapons ban. Feels very sneaky or at the very least intellectually dishonest as that amendment is clearly in place in order to protect against a tyrannical government. Red flag laws. The idea here is that family members, friends, coworkers, or neighbors can alert authorities to someone they feel is dangerous. On the face of it, this seems like a solid idea because in every single instance, people have warned authorities or at least complained that this person might be dangerous. Very few people go from regular guy to murderer overnight. So why wouldn't people want these laws? Because they'll be abused. You're gonna have anti-gun people calling the cops and anyone that has a gun. You will have angry exes calling the cops on their former boyfriends. And there's something uncomfortable about the potential to lose a natural right over someone's opinion. If Democrats don't understand these concerns, any legislation associated with this is gonna be dead on arrival. If we're gonna consider going forward with a red flag law in any meaningful way, I still don't know if it's a good idea, but at a minimum, I would expect the following. Number one, no removal of guns without due process. Just because Karen across the street doesn't like me and doesn't like that I have guns, doesn't mean I need SWAT kicking in my front door. Two, a very short time period to arrive at a judicial decision. This isn't something that should be hanging over people's heads for months and months. Three, the burden of proof has to be on the accuser. Four, there needs to be a significant penalty for those that abuse the process. And five, a method for reviewing people's mental health on a continuous basis so that they can regain their rights once they are healthy. Almost all of these guys have the same profile. Most of them are young men that feel slighted by women or from other men. The rest tend to be middle-aged men under financial duress that lash out at the people they feel are responsible. We have patterns here and we have to find a constitutional way to solve the problem. And I'm not telling you that I have the answer, but I have a pretty good handle on why we can't find the answer and that's because we're not allowed to talk about it. My longtime business partner, Tim Kennedy, said in an answer to Tim Ferriss on a podcast in response to the question, why do 21 year olds need to have an AR? I don't know, maybe they don't. His intent was that even he, as the biggest 2A proponent I have ever met in my entire life, shouldn't be afraid to have any conversation with any person. Why can't we ask that question? Talking about it doesn't hurt anybody. If that question is crushing to you and makes you see red, then how do we even address the problem? I'm not saying that the answer is to remove gun rights, but we should be able to ask anything and look at it objectively and come up with a data set that answers questions. Yesterday, Dan Crenshaw, a retired SEAL and freshman congressman, threw out the idea that maybe we should look at red flag laws. He is now being called an oath breaker. He can't even float the idea of something different without all of the people that have supported him rapidly turning on him in an instant. I've had big celebrities in our space tell me privately that they don't even want to talk about this stuff because a single misstep can crush them. Yesterday, Tim hopped on Fox News and talked about how one of the main issues with some of these young men is that no one has taught them how to be men and society doesn't allow them to make mistakes. They haven't had mentors. They haven't learned how to cope with adversity and rejection and life. And he had a host of suggestions about how to deal with that and he is absolutely getting slammed. Others have brought up issues with psychotropic drugs and how many of these mass murderers are on them and they get slammed. Five minutes ago, I had an employee walk into my office and tell me that he was worried about me talking about this stuff because it might affect shirt sales. People are afraid to talk. Why? Because of the rage mob. I never speak for other people, but I know that Tim feels the same way that I do about this. We believe that we serve an incredible community of patriotic Americans, and the people that I served with, the people that I know, are not afraid of words. We cannot solve this problem by not talking about it or just regurgitating each side's talking points. That gets us absolutely nowhere. 
And if those of us that value the Constitution, that value gun rights, that believe profoundly in the Second Amendment, can't have a conversation about this because we're worried that some dude behind a keyboard is gonna bash us, then who are we? So those are my thoughts. I don't have an answer. I have some ideas, and I'd like to hear yours. Not about what won't work, but what will. I own guns. I own ARs. I have no intention of giving up either. Let's, as a community, figure out how to solve this, because if we don't, the idiots will, and nobody wants that. Ideas, even contradictory ones, even ones you find uncomfortable, do not impugn someone's character. They are critical to finding solutions, so let's find one. After a short but tense week of vacancy in the governor's seat, Puerto Rico swore in Secretary of State Pedro Pierluisi. This lasted one week. Then Pedro's appointment was deemed unconstitutional by the Commonwealth Supreme Court, and he was removed from office. According to law, the Secretary of State needs to be confirmed by both the House and the Senate. Pierre Luisi was only confirmed by the House. Next in line was Justice Secretary Wanda Vasquez. She had previously stated in July that she had no interest in the position. Now, though, she has accepted the position for the stability of Puerto Rico. In other words, she basically became governor by being brand from Game of Thrones and convincing everyone she didn't want the position when actually she did. The remains of an American airman, Colonel Roy Knight Jr., were returned to America this week. Knight was shot down in Vietnam in 1967. His remains were finally found, identified, and flown home to Dallas on a Southwest Airlines flight. The Southwest pilot that flew him home was none other than Brian Knight, his son. The entire airport fell silent as this hero's remains were returned to his family. Fair winds, sir. Welcome home. In falling down news, a man in Southern California went on a stabbing spree this week. Police were unable to determine a motive other than this guy was really pissed. The 33-year-old Garden Grove resident stabbed two men inside his complex, allegedly over an argument. He then went on to rob a nearby bakery. Following that, the guy robbed a neighboring insurance business. And then next, he hit the adjacent cash checking business. He then drove off in his car, rolled up to a gas station, and attacked the guy pumping gas for no apparent reason. He also stabbed the guy in a subway, followed a security guard into a convenience store, stabbed him, took his gun, and started to walk out of a convenience store. At this point, the police finally caught up to him, were waiting for him outside, and the guy surrendered without a fight. In total, four people were killed and two people were seriously injured, although they're expected to recover. This begs the question, what was this guy so mad about? What would send him over the edge to commit such pointless violence? Apparently there's a cool new movie where a Brazilian drug dealer breaks out of prison dressed as his own daughter in order to infiltrate his previous organization and take back what was stolen from him. Oh right, <laughs> that really happened. This guy actually thought that would work. Clauvino da Silva, also known as Shorty, was rearrested this week trying to break out of prison dressed as his 19-year-old daughter who he left back in the cell dressed as him. The guards noticed that the woman was acting very nervous as she tried to leave the prison and also that she looked markedly like a dude. Like at the end of any good Scooby-Doo episode, they ripped off the silicone mask to find not a daughter, but in fact, Calvino himself, who exclaimed, and I would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you pesky guards. After the failed escape bid, he was transferred to maximum security prison. The fanfare was short-lived, however, as he was found dead in his cell, reportedly by suicide. But I've seen enough movies to know that this is probably just phase two in an extremely elaborate attempt to escape. For the Worst Coach Ever Award, Kurt James Brockaway was arrested this week for choke slamming a 13-year-old for not taking off his hat during the National Anthem. This took place at a small rodeo event in the town of Superior, Montana. Brockaway told the court that he had asked the boy to take off his hat. When the boy responded with F you, he picked up the kid by his throat and slammed his head into the ground. Lawyers have predicted a fairly heavy sentence for this man, while astrologists have predicted fist-sized meteors may be heading to this man's face in the future under the light of the crescent moon. And finally in Florida Man news, Florida Man is on the good side for once. A man in Nokomis, Florida rescued his dog from the jaws of a hungry alligator. And when I say rescued, 
I don't mean that he like grabbed his dog at the last second or scared the alligator away when it got too close. I mean the alligator had the dog in its jaws and was preparing to ninja death roll this dog to death when the man leaped on top of it and somehow got superhuman strength and pried the alligator's jaws open to rescue his chocolate lab. Both the Florida man and the dog were injured, but expect to make a full recovery. This goes to show you crazy, crazy people of Florida that with great power comes great responsibility. And we are very happy to see you use your powers of crazy just this once to do a good deed. And with that, I'm Nick Palmashano. And I'm Matt Finney's evil brother. And this is the Bad News Network. Our news is at least as bad as the news you're getting already, and Tom Brady's looking great.